Okay, I, Gordon says I gotta keep it short, but uh, I think a lot of people in this room know Gord Miller. A number of us in this room have worked with Gord Miller. I worked for several years with Gord on um, fascinating issues on the Great Lakes. And if you wanna work with Gord, you gotta travel, because he takes you to very interesting communities across Ontario to, to uh, consult. So Gord was sworn in as the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario on January 31st, 2000, to oversee the continued implementation of the Environmental Bill of Rights. He's now been reappointed for his third term. As an independent officer appointed by the Legislative Assembly, Commissioner Miller oversees 13 ministries and monitors and reports annually on government compliance, government of progress on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, activities in Ontario to reduce the use or make more efficient use of electricity, natural gas, propane oil, and transportation fuels. Prior to his appointment as Environmental Commissioner, Gord worked as a scientist in pollution abatement and in environmental education and training. And as, as ECO, he's released 12 annual reports, seven special reports, four greenhouse gas progress reports, and four energy conservation progress reports to the Ontario Legislature. It's terrific we've got you here today, Gord. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for hanging around here today. Uh, I, I hope I still have my half hour there, Rob. You know, Problem speaking, at the end of the day, as everybody's bored, even including me, and I'm talking, you know. But I, I hope to keep the pace out. No, we're going to talk about uh, environmental challenges moving earth materials because, you know, uh, that's what we're talking about, earth materials. Let's see if this works. There you are. Okay. Thank you. So I know how it works. So, and today we've heard, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of information, and much of what I'm, is in my talk is, is, has been already said today, but I, what I'm going to try to do, because I think it's appropriate, is to try to, if I was going to say simplify, not simplify, try to wrap it up or organize it a little bit, and then, I, and yes, I'm going to talk about how we can move forward some of these things, and I'm going to give our legislators an idea of how we might move forward, because uh, there is, I think, a path forward to in, that incorporates a lot of these concerns and, so, and such things. So let's, let's look. Let, first and foremost, let's, let's get a sense on the... Uh, on the magnitude of this problem, I thought it was very clear. Things that as I, I borrowed this from the RCA, CCA, uh, uh, one of their publications, and it's just a, uh, a summary, if you can read it, of, of the, the estimate of low and high range of the volume of excess construction material moving in Ontario each year, and you see the upper number is a number like 25 million tons. That's the, the estimate. I don't know how good it is, but it sounds good enough to me. And, and think about that. That's, a, that's a, an area that's a kilometer long and a kilometer wide and higher than an eight-story building. That's the volume that is 25 million. Yeah, that might work the math there, Doug. He's, he's, he's still done. It's, it's, it's a huge amount of material, and, and that's the point. But here's the other point that I want to point out. On the yellow band in there, we see what are the big numbers in that 25? We see it. It's from the residential sewer and water name and roads. That's the kind of construction, that's where this huge volume is coming from. So, so that's something, first point to get to take into consideration. The other thing we're gonna talk about, we talked about today, it's sort of come, I'm gonna sort of crystallize is the jurisdictional issues. First, we talk, heard a lot of talk about Ministry of Environment. I work for the Ministry of Environment. I ran the North Bay District Office, and there weren't different standards then. <laughs> the, uh, but the Ministry of Environment, you know, has often mentioned this, and they really, this is not their business. Their business is pollution and protecting the environment. And I mean, this is, this is, and they're limited in the powers they have to the three areas. One is, we've heard a lot about, Doug put out the adverse effect. The adverse effect is well-defined in 40 years of legislation, and there has to be an adverse effect for the Environmental Protection Act powers that come into play to, for the Ministry of Environment to be involved. We're talking in most of this material of material that does not have an adverse, cause an adverse effect. So the ministry doesn't have jurisdiction over most of this material. Or the material could be a waste. If it's classified, we can get it classified as a waste, then Ministry of Environment laws and regulations apply. But this is not waste. This enjoys the exemption of being inert fill. And you say, what's inert fill? Well, we don't know, but we know it's not waste. And we have this thing called inert fill. We know table one is inert fill, but we don't know what else is inert fill. So Ministry of Environment, again, does not have jurisdiction over most of this stuff. We, they do have something called a record of site condition. You see here these mention of 14304, only regulations and things. But all, and so there's some rule there, but all the power the Ministry of Environment is, 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 has is to require there be a record of site condition. That's all. Once the record exists, the ministry's fulfilled its legal obligation. That there's, they have no ability to do anything. So, so remember, it's not, and you'll see the point as I go through this. We've also heard the Conservation Authority has a role. Yeah, they do. 
But there, there as, as uh, uh, Chris, we got it right? Yeah, Chris pointed out that their, their jurisdiction is limited to this, first of all, the word pollution that exists in Section 28. Well, if the Ministry of Environment adverse effect doesn't apply, you'd be have a hard time saying you had jurisdiction for pollution. So that's, that's a limitation, and they certainly have jurisdictions when there's issues of flow of water that relate to the direct uh, uh, interests of, of managing the, the watershed, but, but again, there's limitations on what conservation authorities um, have, and of course there's some lands which they was clear, clear, quickly pointed out where they don't apply at all. Municipalities have, now of course they do have a, a quite considerable, powerful, the site alteration bylaws are, are it's, a, it's a powerful tool. It, it uh, has all the things. They can collect money. They can direct things. They can, you know, really control a lot of, uh, of what goes on in the site if they're willing to use their, their, their full powers. But, but it's the, in our, the kind of cases we're talking about here, the jurisdiction is on the receiving end, right? You're, it's, only, it's only the Scugog, it's only the township here that gets it. It's not generating it. So that limits in what they can do. They can only play with the receiving end. And of course, they are trumped if the, uh, the Conservation Authority uh, has uh, jurisdiction. So that's a pretty limited, you can start to see why we got a problem here. And we got, we're maybe looking in the wrong place. There's some other ministries are involved here. It should be Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the Ministry of Infrastructure. And we'll talk more about those. But those are mysteriously missing from m most of the, the list we talked about today. So, but uh, the first point I want to make is that we, this is, this is a large-scale fill symposium. We're talking about the fill. For, we, this is not about filling at all. Recognize what it is. It's about digging holes. Think about it. Would you have a fill problem if they weren't digging holes in Toronto? Why are you buying this problem? This is not your problem. It's their problem. They dig the holes. Why do we dig holes? I'm on Bay Street with my office. Across from me, they're putting well, any number now of, of condominium apartments. The first thing they're condominium buildings, the first thing they do is they dig a massive hole that goes down six stories. And all that dirt comes up here to make you people busy. And why do we dig a hole six stories deep? for parking cars. That's why we dig it, because the municipal bylaws of Toronto require to be a big hole to park cars. Well, you could park cars above ground, you could build a parking garage above ground, or you could not have park parking for cars, and then people would use transit and not. And why do we build massive parking? Everywhere, our world is driven by providing parking. We dig big holes in Toronto and cause problems in, in Scugog because we want to park cars in downtown. and most. And most of the time, they're not even used, the parking space. We, we have heard some reference to un, the, the Ministry of Environment Standards. We dig holes to get stuff out of, the, out of that spot because we want to build residences now. And there used to be an industry now. And we've got to get, and the, the ministry guidelines say you've got to get to a certain level of cleanliness so they can change the zoning from uh, industrial commercial to, uh, to residential. So, and OK, conceptually, there's some logic to that. But there's an awful lot of standards there, and some of them, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, are unnecessarily strict. So sometimes we're, we're digging holes and moving dirt for really no good reason. And the other thing is project design. We're digging holes because we're, we're, we're changing grades, and we can do, you know, if, if I, I'm a great admirer of our engineering capacity in this, in this province, and I know that if you challenge an engineer, with a problem about uh, cut and fill, or the amount, or grades, the amount of dirt you have to move, uh, if you put a restriction on them, they will come up with a clever, maybe a little expensive, but a clever way to solve that problem and not move as much material. But we don't. We tell that engineer, you know what? Don't worry about it. We'll just truck it away. We'll put it in trucks, and the trucks go away. So we did. So why do we dig these holes? That's why we. So then why do we have to move so much? Because it's cheaper to move than incorporate it into the design. Uh, what wasn't referenced today is what's happening in, in Great Britain and a, a lot of the construction demolition areas in places like Britain and or in continental uh, uh, Europe. They they don't have this problem because they don't allow it to be moved. If you want to truck construction ma material off off a site in, in London, England, you're paying a huge dollar per ton tax. And guess what? When you start taxing what moves, geez, people find a way of move, not moving it. They, they find a way of 
using it on site or incorporating it in, and making it into the concrete or making it or even using whole parts of old buildings. So we, we move be, because we don't incorporate the design because it's cheaper just to throw it in trucks and when the, pro when the trucks disappear around the corner, the problem disappears with them. But then the problem comes, it comes up here and starts here, right? So the problems really start when the trucks get moving and, and when there's large quantities moving, like we say, like 25 to 25 million tons, that's a lot. There is a reference today, we had the nuisance factor, no, no worries, odor, odor dust, uh, these kinds of things. There's no question when you move large volumes, that comes with it. Uh, and there's, a, and there's a, another factor here that wasn't mentioned, and that is that there's a time-space factor, I call it. And, and that is what was alluded to, the fact that we, we, we have this stuff, it could, some of it could be reused, but just not now because we're big, building so many condos in Toronto, we're building the, the new uh, transit project that uh, Glenn mentioned is gonna be, produce vast amounts of, of things. That's a short-term thing. I mean, it's gonna be vast amounts of material that has to be moved, but it's at the same time we're doing all the condo development, same time some of the other infrastructure development. Maybe over the 10-year or the 15-year basis, we, we can reuse a lot of this material effectively, but it's a time factor. We have to deal, we have to deal with that, and that's where storage comes into the play. But the urgency of the time factor, because we have to feel we have to dispose of it now, that makes for bad decisions, right? We just, and that makes us for, oh, well, just find some place. Just get rid of it, right? And that's what's, what's driving this. That's the hysteria that, you know, is causing by rural areas that are on the receiving end is a great wave of material. There are potential long-term uses for a lot of this material. And, and, those, and that storage is a viable option. The Europeans do it routinely. And, and they found that you know, countries like the Netherlands, where uh, land is at a premium, they're, they're very careful about their dirt, you know, and, and they, they manage it well. And we just have this casual attitude towards it. And then, of course, when we place it, the receiving municipality doesn't control the source. That's been alluded to. And there's so many uncertainties about what, what happens, what's coming, coming in. And, the, the, and if the material comes in, it could compromise the land, even if, it, even if it's not really dirty, if it's just, see, because there are several standards of soil here. There's, there's adverse effect soil. Ministry's got no problem. Dolly's got no problem with that. The boys come down, flash their badges, do all sorts of things, have a good time. <laughs> no adverse effect. And, oh, and on the other end of the screen, really, really clean stuff, table one stuff, because no problems, not our business, whatever, let Doug go build some farms, right? But in the middle, there's no, now we've created effectively several other categories by saying it, if you change the zoning, you've got to fix, have this category or that category. So what can happen is, is what happened in, in the one case that was talked about, is that you have land that's zoned industrial commercial because it used to be an aggregate site, was properly closed and rehabilitated. And then somebody said, oh, I'll get that land. Now we're going to try, and it's perfectly good land, and I'm sure it would have passed the agricultural standards. Uh, and now oh, we're going to truck in industrial commercial fill from the city, and when we fill that land in, now it can never be zoned residential or, or agricultural again. We permanently rezoned it by trucking it. And that, that's fundamentally wrong. That's a permanent downgrade of the land. That's, not, that's the highest, not the highest and best use. That's downgrading uh, a land resource. So that's not good. And we've talked about, there are lots of talks about the inappropriateness of the hydrogeology and uh, effects on groundwater and that sort of thing. There wasn't a lot of talk about compatibility with adjacent land, but I think it's in the room. And that is, uh, you don't want, you know, a lot of people don't want this next to them. And a lot of people, uh, you know, have a, a, you know, have some concern about the landscape. They bought the land. They bought the farm they're on or the piece of rural property, specifically because it was rural property of a kind of, kind of form. It had the same, and so they have a stake in the, in the, in the issue of what that land may be transformed into. And, of course, there's nuisance during placement activities. There's, there's all the same noise, odor, odor and dust problems uh, we saw uh, referenced on some of the slides. So it's the placement problems. So let's talk about regulation and control issues. Now, there's one that wasn't talked about, but it is a real thing in Ontario that we have to come to face with. I call it the laissez-faire argument. And laissez-faire is this, you know, get the government off my land. It's my land. I don't want, I got a sign. Government, stay off my land, right? Right? That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a legitimate role. If it, and, if, and, if, and if you have that kind of situation, and, and the only thing I want on my land is trucks full of dirt at $60 or $600 or whatever the going rate is, right? 100 100 sorry, we settled that, right. 
100, 100, 100, 150, 100, 100, 100, 100. I got 600 over here. But stay off my land, that is an issue. Because, it, it, because when it gets down to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, uh, where John has to work, uh, you know, then people say, well, it's property rights, and people have the right to do what they want and get money for it and whatever, and they do. But we, remember, so when we're talking about this stuff, we're talking about infringing or limiting those property rights. But there is a huge, uh, huge issue about the opportunities for unlawful activities. And people are on the edge of it. So, you know, I know, I'm pretty confident that we can reasonably regulate uh, the honest world of, of soil and fill. But let's be honest, I work for the industry environment. We's, you can't regulate the mafia really easily. And they will take advantage of these things. Because if it does cost thousands of dollars to get rid of a truckload of material, and if, they can, and if you've got 500 trucks a day coming into a property, and there's 501 trucks coming in there, hardly, people will hardly notice, right? So there is an issue about enforcement, and I'm very aware that that's, that's, that's a regulatory control issue. And the fact has been alluded to, there's no information management in most of this activity. There's little or no sampling, or the sampling is, is a questionable, and it's in terms of its accuracy. I can deal with that if you want. I, there's a better way of doing that. But, but, but there's, and there's no tracking. Sometimes there is. We heard examples. Uh, Patrick was talking about uh, tra tra tracking. I know it's done right, or it can be done right, but most of the time it's not. It's just not done. The financial mechanisms are weak or too cheap because, again, the Europeans control this stuff by taxing it when you try to move it. And then people are more creative and are very concerned about moving uh, earth materials. And I mentioned storage sites, and, and there are some advantages of storage sites, but there, right now there are no regulatory structure for storage sites. Quite frankly, if somebody come up and say, hey, we're going to put a big storage, well, there is some regulation. I know you run, a, you were, but you're running re soil re rehabilitation sites. I'm talking straight storage of clean soil. And, and there's a great uncertainty about that, and there should be some regulatory certainty around that. So people, so municipalities would know, okay, if they follow these set of rules and these regulations, we can we can uh, trust them to have run one of those in my municipality, that kind of thing. So those are some of the things we heard today and some of the other ones that, that I see around this issue. And on the first instance, there's, there's opportunities for improvement. I, uh, here's a, I'm going to list a few here. Uh, there were money, and there were, you have to tease them out of all the presentations, but, but certainly refining the Ministry of Environment standards has been referred to, and there, there are some opportunities there, there's no question. Uh, Reconsidering the parking requirements, and the reason we dig these holes and the reason we take the stuff is clearly an opportunity because it's not it's something we have to do. We've met, had best management practices, uh, the document that MOE is working on, or, or has posted on the EBR, uh, and the RCACA oh, has, uh, has a new uh, uh, best management practices document that, that adds to the MOE based on the European model, or the British model actually. So, and there's no question we should promote that, but that's still not mandatory. So one thing we could, you can do to improve the situation, if municipalities would charge more. If, as I, ex European example is that you make it expensive, it doesn't come. And if you, and you do have the flexibility in your, your, uh, your site uh, um, modification bylaws to charge fees, and if those fees, now, but of course, you don't want to play one, allow one township to be played off against another. Then, it, then if you would have to have a, you know, a consolidated front in this guard if you're going to try to use that mechanism. But, those are the opportunities. What's the fix? What's the fix? What's the one thing that we need? Well, we need for, like this is a very expensive thing. We understand how to do the business. And we, but we need the mechanism. And we know now that Ministry of Environment is not the mechanism. They'll handle the bad guys. That's their job. And the Minister of Conservation Authority, why should they go to great expense? They're not, it's not their problem, right? It's somebody else's problem you're creating in, in, your, in your watershed. But let's put the monkey back on the right back. We'll put the monkey on the right back, not on the MOE's back. Because it's, it's the excavation of earth materials must be managed. And Maureen actually scooped me on this. Yeah, we don't collaborate, but we've known each other for a while. <laughs> and we think similarly on a lot of topics. And, uh, and she mentioned the term life cycle basis. I'm going to emphasize that because you, 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 you threw that out quite accurately, but, but quickly within a bigger idea. What is, what is a life cycle basis? That means that from cradle to grave, the responsibility is the creator's responsibility. 
That means that when, and who, what is the creator? Well, we already covered that. Whoever digs the hole, right? Those who cause the holes to be dug should bear the whole responsibility and full cost of the managing the soil until it's satisfactory placed for the f in its final use. That's the central concept that's missing from this system. Why is it that you people up here in, the, in, in rural Ontario have bought this problem? It's somebody else's problem. And, it, and, and why is it where we dump it on the poor Ministry of the Environment? Well, that's my job, by the way, to dump on the poor Ministry of the Environment. <laughs> So I'm a little, I, I resent a little bit, you know. My job, not yours. But <laughs> big holes are largely the result of the policies of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the money of the Ministry of Infrastructure. That's who's paying. That's who's money. And the big municipalities, like the city of Toronto, by the way. But I think you, know, you sort of alluded to the fact that you're willing to step up to the cost, uh, at least as one of 42. Um, <laughs> But there is no question that the big holes are the result of these ministries who are driving this kind of development, densification in the case, uh, 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 brownfield policy as the case of Ministry of Missile Affairs and Housing. Uh, this, is, this is the stuff, and, and Ministry of Infrastructure is putting billions of dollars into investment in this kind of stuff. It's creating big holes. They are responsible. They are the ones that we should be talking about. We, and we should, the, you know, the, 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 the fix here, the fix is to change the Municipal Act the required materials management plan as part of the development. So if you're going to build, get a permit to build a condominium high rise across from my office and dig a six story hole in the ground, guess what? You're responsible as part of that in a materials management plan that hires Doug and, and tr not you, sorry, Patrick. That's part of the tender, I don't think. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> okay, automatically assigned to Doug and Patrick on an alternating basis, how's that? Sounds like Quebec, no. <laughs> but if you're going to dig that hole in the ground on Bay Street, then you have to have, an, an, as part, I mean, you hire elaborate architectural firms and do and geotechnical firms and hydrogeologic firms to, to deal with all the problems around that. Why wouldn't you also hire a materials, have a materials management plant required by law, by provincial law, it is part of the development plan, which samples and tracks and rates that material for its whole life till its final destination, so it is no longer your problem. That's the thing. There may be some changes to the Planning Act that are required as well, especially relating to soil, uh, soil uh, storage facilities. So that's the fix. That's, where, that's what's missing out of this discussion, discussion. So don't take it on yourself. Don't accept this problem. It's not your problem. Don't pick on Dolly. My job. <laughs> and just so you know, in case you don't know that this, like, this seems to be a, a, a more recent problem, something, this is a report on my website. Uh, it is, uh, I commissioned this report for one of my technical specialists back in, uh, well, we, we published it in 2010, but, but it reviews the history of the sediment quality, soil quality criteria, the whole development ministry and environment for, from the 1970s through December uh, 2009. So if, if those of you that are geeks and into this, if you want to know, this has been ongoing for a long time. There were a lot of solutions proposed and, uh, and not implemented over the years, but there's some historical information for you. So that's the concept. It's not your problem. Let's get it solved where it should be solved at Queen's Park in downtown Toronto. Thank you. <laughs>